for uh, just the lovely weather you're bringing. God, the, the, the leaves are changing and it's just showing that you're still in control, God. The seasons will never fade and pass away until you return. And Lord, that time is getting closer and closer, but you're faithful and your word is a promise. It's yes and amen. So Father, today we want to just let go of all the stuff we carried in this week. Lord, church is not a place for the righteous, Lord. It's a, it's a place for the ones becoming sanctified on the path to righteousness, God. And it's through your righteousness we're saved, through your goodness we're saved. So, Lord, let this be a hospital today. Mend us, mold us, heal us, God, and repair us so we can go back out in the world and get beat up again, but for your glory. So, Father, we thank you. As we continue to worship, just continue to pour out your spirit upon Pastor Randy, upon the message, upon the music, Lord. This is all just for you. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
song this morning. And of course, it's pretty simple. It's just a song of exalting the Lord and giving him all of our praise, all of the, the glory to his name as the Psalms declare. So we just want to teach you guys the chorus real quick. As we give you the highest praise, you deserve it all, you deserve it all. That's it. Can we sing that together?
Let's pray these words together. Bibles to 1 Peter 5. That's going to be our main text. And then um, John chapter 13 is going to be our, our only cross-reference for the morning. But as you're doing that, I want to remind you, two weeks ago on Wednesday nights, rather than going from Jeremiah into the book of Lamentations, we've started a midweek series on servant leadership. We're talking about ministry and how to gauge whether we're doing ministry in a biblical manner. And then we've been looking at servant leadership so that we do ministry with the heart of Jesus, and it's been great. We've had a great turnout both weeks, and uh, I expect that will continue. So even if you didn't get to come out on one of the first two weeks, you can come out starting this Wednesday night, and I promise you're going to be super blessed. So this morning, let's continue in our study of 1 Peter chapter 5. And it's been now five months that we've been studying the book of 1 Peter. 
And we've come now to chapter 5. Our text today will be just verses 5 through 7. But as we're coming to these verses, you're going to see today these are extremely important key verses to the entire book of 1 Peter. So we're going to take it slow today and we're just going to cover these three verses. And so our series title is Standing Firm in a Hostile World. And we're going to start today. If you would, please stand. We are going to read this text together. Uh, If you have a New King James, please read boldly from your Bible. But if you don't have, if you have a different version, just follow on the screen so that we're all reading the same thing. So are you guys ready? Ready to read bold and loud? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Peter says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's pray. Father, even though we have just three verses this morning, Lord, they are so rich. They are so full of instruction for your people. And we want to pray this morning, Lord, that as we're preparing to study this, that you would be preparing our hearts, Lord. And and for that, we have to cooperate with you. So we pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to set aside uh, cares and concerns and just focus on you as we open your word this morning. Lord, we believe you're going to speak clearly. We believe, Lord, that you're going to instruct us. Lord, some of us you're going to correct. But all of us, Lord, you're going to give an opportunity to live in a more biblical and a more fruitful manner. And that's truly what we want. So, Lord, as we now open your word, We pray that the things you show us this morning could be applied to our lives immediately and that we could see good fruit come from this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. So, as I said a minute ago, this is a really key portion of 1 Peter, these three verses in chapter 5. And what I want to do is I want to start by laying a foundation for what we're about to study by reminding you of three things that we've looked at really from the very first study. So I want to first remind you of Peter's audience. Remember that Peter was writing to a group of very committed and bold Christians living in a specific part of the Roman Empire, but the more important thing than where they lived is what they were experiencing. And I'm going to use some key words here. These believers were experiencing trouble from outside of the church that was creating suffering inside the church. In fact, I found this week as I was studying that Peter addresses Christian suffering 21 times in these five chapters. So the second thing, I want to talk about Peter's agenda. If you look ahead just a few verses... In chapter 5, verse 12, we have the key verse to the entire book of 1 Peter. It tells us what he's trying to accomplish. And notice he says, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly. So we're not going to talk about that part of the verse. This is the part we want to focus on where he says, Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Peter wrote this letter to teach believers to stand in the grace of God in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their trials and tribulations. And there's a word I want to draw your attention to here in verse 12. Peter refers to the true grace of God. And I want you to understand he's not contrasting that with like fake grace. That word true could be translated trustworthy. Peter says, I'm teaching you about the trustworthy grace of God. I'm teaching you that in the midst of suffering and trials and tribulations and everything that you're facing, God's grace is sufficient for you. And if you stand on God's grace, you are going to victoriously come through these trials and tribulations that you are facing. So I told you I was going to review three things. The first is the audience. The second was the agenda. Before I get to the third, 
I want to let you in on a little bit of what we're going to talk about this morning. Because as we get into verses 5 through 7, I'm going to have to share with you kind of like some bad news. Because these believers were not standing in the grace of God. In the midst of their trials and their suffering and everything that they were going with, they were not trusting in the sufficiency of God's grace. And they were kind of succumbing to their trouble. In fact, look at this quote that I found. This kind of sums up what we're going to see today. This author says that troubles from outside the church had created tensions inside the church. I actually want to say that again. Troubles from outside the church had created tensions from inside the church. Does that sound like the last three years of life in America, of church in America, where trouble outside the church has created a lot of tension inside the church? This author goes on to say that suffering tends to bring out the worst in people, and Christians aren't immune to bad behavior during times of trouble and suffering. And I'm just going to speak boldly this morning. But I will say that since 2020, March of 2020, when uh, coronavirus came on the scene and then right behind coronavirus came governments of the world kind of exercising what we would call political overreach and, you know, pressuring the church from outside. And then we had a very volatile presidential election in 2020. All of these pressures outside the church have brought a lot of tension inside the church. And just to be honest, we've seen a lot of bad behavior within the church. I know you don't want to hear that, but I'm going to say it. Just get it out there. There's a lot of bad behavior in the church. In fact, to kind of qualify that, because I don't want you to think I'm just making this up. For years, I have been subscribing. In fact, it was accidental. Some other guy with, with a Pastor Randy email who doesn't know his own email subscribed me to this daily email from an organization called churchleaders.com. And, and so about three times a day, I get these different emails with articles on all sorts of things regarding church leadership. And some of them are really good. But I made a note that going back to March of 2020, when our world changed drastically, like I just talked about, I have seen a huge increase in the articles on churchleaders.com, how this organization is just trying to help church leaders navigate the bad behavior that goes on within the church right now, surrounding all of the things that I've just talked about in a second. So are you ready for the third thing that... I told you I was going to review because we've talked about this week after week after week. I said all that to kind of prime you for how similar our current situation is here in America. I think that Christians in in the year 2022 are exactly where Peter's audience was when he was writing. We're in that same place where pressure and suffering or pressure from outside the church is creating suffering and bad behavior inside the church. It's brought out the worst in a lot of Christians. And I mean, again, I just, I'm just going to say it this morning. In fact, I'm going to say a lot of things this morning that I think the church in America needs to hear, but I think they're going to be edified and I think they're going to be good. So as Peter's writing here in first Peter, what we learned last week is that when the church is experiencing a great deal of suffering, the church needs strong leadership. So the first four verses of this chapter Peter wrote to the elders, and he addressed the elders of the church, the men that God has called to lead and to guide the church, and he said, guys, you've got a big job in front of you. You need to shepherd the flock of God that is among you, and you need to do that by teaching the word, and you need to lead with integrity, and you need to protect from false teaching and things like that. Well, this week, Peter reminds us that during times of trouble, the church also needs good, strong followers. So what Peter's going to do today is he's going to teach us a number of things. I've I've titled this message, Portrait of a Good Sheep. Last week was Portrait of a Good Shepherd. Today, Portrait of a Good Sheep. And let me just give you a list of four things that Peter's going to teach us today. In verse 5, he's going to teach us the source of bad behavior in the church. There in verse 5, he'll also give us the solution for bad behavior in the church. He's going to tell us the solution to stressed relationships in the church. And then he'll close our study today 
by just addressing the solution for stressed saints. I think what we're going to see today is that there's a lot of stress and it's creating a lot of bad behavior. And Peter says, let's deal with that. So he begins here in verse 5 by identifying what we're going to call the source of bad behavior in the church. Please notice in verse 5 that, that Peter opens up with the word likewise. Do you see that? Likewise. That verse is tying us back to verses 2 and 3. So go back and read those with me. He says here, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So last week, Peter said this to the elders and the pastors in the church. He said, listen, your motive for serving and your conduct while serving are really important to you doing a good job. Now Peter is going to address the members of the church, and he says, your motive and your conduct are very important and needs to be examined. And so he begins here, if you look at verse 5, you'll notice that part of verse 5 is in quotation marks. And he says here, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter is quoting Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, a verse that his audience would have been very familiar with. But in case we're not, let's read it again. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This morning, what we're going to do, the reason we're only covering three verses is because we're going to dig super deep into a lot of the individual words that Peter chose to use. And two of them are right here in verse 5. We're going to look at the word pride, and then we're going to look at another word. We'll get to it in just a minute. But what Peter's doing here is he's speaking to misbehaving saints within the church, and he says, pride is is the source of all bad behavior. He, he, he speaks to the church with just pulling no punches at all. He just comes right out and he says, when there's bad behavior among Christians, it's because pride is present. Now, Peter could have chosen a number of different Greek words as he was writing this, but he chose a very specific Greek word that I think helps you and I really, really understand what he was trying to communicate to us. Thayer's Greek lexicon defines this word pride as one with an overweening estimate of their means or merits, despising others or even treating them with contempt or haughtiness. That's quite a word, isn't it? Did you notice I didn't attempt to pronounce the Greek word like I normally do? We have a bunch of Greek words in this text that I'm just not going to even try today because I practiced and I just said, forget it. You guys can figure it out on your own. These are some hard Greek words, but I'm going to focus on the definitions. I want you to look carefully at this. Peter says, when there is bad behavior in the church, it's because you have individuals or groups of people who have an overweening estimate of their means or their merits, and they despise others or even treat them with contempt or with haughtiness. And when we start talking about pride within the body of Christ, when we start talking about pride within the local church, we have to be sober about it. We have to go back and we have to think about what does the Bible say about pride? So I'm going to give you two examples. The first comes from Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. It, it, it's the fall of Satan. And you can go read those chapters later on, but it was pride that caused Lucifer to rebel against God. He, he decided that he had an overweening estimate of himself or his own merits, and he says, I'm going to be like the Most High. And the result of that was that Satan was kicked out of God's presence. Eventually, he's going to end up in the lake of fire. Now, the second example comes from Genesis chapter 3, and it's Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve exercised pride in the presence of God, they disobeyed God's word to them, which was an act of pride. It was an act of rebellion. And they were cast out of the garden. And here we are today living with the consequences of what one husband and wife team did. And, and don't think too highly of yourselves, because if you were there in the garden or I was there in the garden, guess what? The human race would still be in the position it's in because one of us would have failed or both of us 
would have failed. So keep that in mind for a minute as we're talking about pride. Because the second word I want to show you in the text here in verse 5 describes to us God's response to human pride. And it's the word resists. And it's a very interesting Greek word also. I'm still struggling with not feeling well and super congested, so excuse me there. But the second word, resists, is pretty awesome too. Notice it means to arrange in battle against. And I'm telling you, if you go to your Greek lexicon or your Strong's Concordance or something, I chose the milder of all of the interpretations of this Greek word. But what Peter is trying to tell us is that when a Christian especially in the context of the local church, decides to start walking in pride, it's like picking a fight with God. You want to pick a fight with God? You want to see God rise up against you, you know, get his army against you in battle, so to speak? Just walk in pride. That's what Peter is telling us. In fact, this is a quote I'd like you to look at up on the screen. Peter's audience needed to be reminded that prideful conduct in the church is always met with divine opposition. This is his point. Peter's saying, don't think that pride is a sin that you should play with. Peter comes along and he says, no, pride in the life of a believer is a deadly sin. You will find God fighting against you. And and I will say this is that Oftentimes when I'm studying the Bible and I'm preparing to teach you, I like to try to get inside the author of Scripture's head. So whether it's Paul or Peter or whoever we're studying, and oftentimes I'll look at this and I'll say, what was going through Peter's head as he is saying to a local church, don't mess with pride lest you find God opposing you. And I just started thinking about all the different things that Peter saw firsthand in his life. And in Acts chapter 5 Something really sticks out to me. You can go read it later, but you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The church was going through this beautiful time of growth, and people were being generous towards the Lord, and so what they were doing is they were selling stuff and and bringing and giving the money to the Lord to care for the poor and, and, you know, to, to do whatever the money was being used for. And this guy, Ananias, and his wife, Sapphira, said, man, would like some attention like that. We want to be brought up in front of the whole church and Someone say, hey, you know, this, this couple gave a gift. So they come up with this plan. And what they did is they sold a piece of land, and then they gave a portion to the church, and that was perfectly fine. They can do whatever they want with their money. But they presented to the church this idea that they had given everything. And that bothered God. It, it, God said, that's pride. And so what God did in two phases, the first is... Ananias shows up, and Peter says, hey, Ananias, when you sold that field, um, were these the true details of that transaction? And and Ananias, yeah, dude, yep, absolutely. All to Jesus, I surrender. (laughs) Boom, he falls over dead. But not before Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And so picture later on, guy doesn't show up after work, so his wife says, he's probably hanging out at the church. He always likes being at the church, you know. She goes, down, hey, Peter, have you seen my husband? And Peter goes, before I answer that question, I need to ask you a question. When you guys sold that land and, and yada, 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 are these the details of that transaction? Absolutely, Peter. All to Jesus I surrender, right? Boom, she falls over dead. You know, the deacons of the church were busy that day hiding bodies. Here's the point. As I think Peter says, listen, I don't want to have to go back and reteach what happened in Acts chapter 5. He says, church, simply believe that when you allow pride into your life, it becomes a deadly sin. It may not cost you your life, but it's going to bring death. And he's going to go on and he's going to talk about some of that. So we identified human pride as the source of all bad behavior in the church. Now Peter goes on. And he talks about the solution to bad behavior in the church. And just let me say this up front, because I might not touch on it as we go through. But Peter refers to the solution three different times. The problem he referred to once. But as we go through the rest of this text, he refers to the solution three different times. And if you notice, 
here in verse 5, here's the solution. He says, be clothed with humility. And in English, it's four words. You see that right there on the pages of your Bible. But in Greek, it's only two words. You have clothed, and it's a verb, and then you have humility. And we want to talk about this. I want to talk about this word clothed. And uh, again, it's, it's hard to pronounce, and I didn't, you know how sometimes I put it on the screen phonetically? I didn't even try that this week because I knew I would try to pronounce it in front of you. We got some hard Greek words today, so I'm not going to try to pronounce this. Uh, But the word clothed here, it's the only time it's used in the entire New Testament, and it's just an absolutely fascinating verb. But before I give you the verb, I'm going to tell you what the noun was. The noun of this Greek word was either an apron or a little piece of cloth ribbon that a slave used to identify himself to the rest of the world. So he'd either put on the apron and everybody knew he's a slave, or it was this ribbon and they would tie it around their belt in such a way that when they went into a public place, such as a church, that everybody around them knew, I am here to serve, not to be served. I am lower than you, you are more important than me. So Peter says, he uses the verb form of that noun, and he says, clothe yourself, take upon yourself the identification of a slave. And when you are with the church, when you are out in the world, you need to conduct yourself as a slave. You need to first identify yourself as a slave, but you do that by clothing yourself. Take upon you the garment that identifies you as a slave. And then the next word goes with it. It's the word humility. And this is the polar opposite of pride. It's a deep sense of one's littleness. I got to tell you, how many of you like walking in a room and just saying, I'm the smallest person here? Does anybody ever walk in and just be like, hey, I am nobody. And I just need you guys to know that. I'm also nothing. And I'm here for whatever you need. If anybody in here needs like a toilet cleaned, or you want me to wash your car, and I'll even put two coats of wax, you know. And you know, None of us, we walk into rooms and we size people up, and we're like, okay, I'm taller than that guy, dress better than that guy. And I, don't we do that? And, and Peter says, that is the polar opposite of what a Christian's supposed to do. A Christian is supposed to clothe themselves with absolute humility. When we look in the mirror, we're supposed to say, okay, don't forget you, You're the least. You're the littlest. In fact, this word is best summed up by Paul in chapter 2, verse 3 of Philippians. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's the same Greek word, humility, let each esteem others better than himself. Peter says the same thing as Paul. He says, every moment of every day, we need to clothe ourselves with this attitude. This is who we're supposed to be. This is how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. But don't miss the fact that he used the word clothe yourself. And again, let's get in Peter's mind. What happened in Peter's life that caused him to get on this idea of clothing oneself with humility? And I'll tell you that I believe it was something that Peter witnessed in John chapter 13. If you marked your Bible, turn there, turn or swipe. I was telling first service, I used to love back in the old days when you told a church turn and you heard this all across hundreds of Bibles. Now it's silent because everybody's going. And I'm not calling you a hypocrite because I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not being a hypocrite. I've got one up here too. I just miss the sound of Adam. Could you design an app where when people turn their speakers go, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. let's do that. There'll be a Calvary Chapel Bible app where the pages turn with noise don't anybody use that. That was my idea. We're going we're gonna to build our children's ministry building with the money we make from that. So don't run with that one. Okay, look at John 13 two. This is the evening that Jesus was betrayed, his last night of being alive here on the earth. And in verses 2 through 5 of John 13... It says, supper being ended, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. 
And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and he laid aside his garments. He took a towel and he girded himself. It's another Greek word, but it's the same idea. He clothed himself. But before he could clothe himself, he had to take off what he was wearing. So Jesus takes off his regular everyday clothes, his robe, and he sets it aside. And he girds himself with a towel. A towel was the garments of the lowest household slave. It was customary at this time when you arrived at somebody's house that they would have a slave, usually the lowest servant in the whole household, that would meet you at the gate, meet you at the door, and they would either wash your feet and anoint your feet with oil, or they would at least provide you with water and a towel and anointing oil so that your feet could be clean. And when they arrived here for this Passover dinner, nobody met them to wash their feet. And so as dinner is over, and I wonder if all the disciples are going, man, nobody washed our feet. I wonder if they're going to send a slave to wash our feet. Imagine how surprised they were when Jesus gets up. He takes off his outer garments. He puts a towel on himself. And then, verse 5, he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, in a couple of weeks on a Wednesday night, we're going to go into depth on this portion of Scripture in our servant leadership class. But for today, let me just give you the bare minimum here about what this is about. 33 years before this, Jesus had done something similar. He left heaven where he was the object of worship, where he lived in a divine glorified body, and he takes off, so to speak, his divine nature, and he clothes himself with humanity so that he could come to earth and live a perfect life in our place, die a substitutionary death in our place, and anybody who puts their faith in his finished work could have their sin forgiven and be saved. Now, 33 years later, he does it again. He takes off his outer clothes. He puts on the garments of a slave, and he begins washing the feet of everybody present. And I believe that in 1 Peter 5, he's thinking back to this. He's saying, what is the ultimate act of clothing yourself with humility? He says, well, it's what our Savior did. He washed the feet even of Judas, who was about to walk out of this room and betray him. And Peter says, listen, saint, Christian, there is no place in the life of a Christian, there is no place in the life of the local church for pride when we have been called to clothe ourselves with humility in order to serve one another. And so, having looked at the source of all bad behavior in the church and now looking at the solution to bad behavior in the church, Peter goes on and he tells us how to apply all this. Everything we've done up to this point, church, is just simply doctrine and theology. We've, we've just kind of talked about truth. And now Peter comes along and he says, let's apply that truth. So we get to verse 5. And as we're getting here into verse 5, we're learning that the churches Peter was writing to were experiencing the same kinds of things that every church has ever experienced. And that is what we're about to see. There was strife between the pew and the pulpit, and there was strife between the pew and the pew. Let me say that another way. There was strife between the sheep and the shepherds, and there was strife among the sheep. And Peter's going to say now, let's deal with that, because that is not God's will. And I'm going to tell you that, that Peter's going to go through here, and he's going to say, here's the key. Here's how we fix that. You guys ready? One word. He says, submission. And we're all like, well, let's go home now. We don't want to talk about submission. We like being like the master of our own destiny. But remember this Greek word, hupotasso, that we translate submission in a military fashion. It, it means to arrange yourself under your ranking officer, under your superior officer. But in a non-military environment, it simply means to willingly arrange yourself under your leader or to willingly cooperate with someone else. And so Peter says, I'm going to address two things. He says, I'm going to address conflict between sheep and shepherds, and I'm going to address conflict among the sheep. And so he says here, likewise, verse 5, you younger people, and that is literally translated young men, he says, submit yourself to your elders. 
So, so first I want you to see that Peter says, hey, the, there's a tendency among young men to kind of think that they've got everything all figured out, and so they have a tendency to be less submissive than older men. Let's just qualify this. How many of you have teenagers or have raised teenagers? How many of you have ever had one of your teenagers challenge you? How did that go for them? In my house, it didn't go real well, but, you know, when I challenged my dad, that did not go well at all. But here's the thing is that, you know, youth has a tendency to think they got everything all figured out. And, you know, so Peter says, hey, those of you younger people in the church, and and I think what he was really getting at is anybody younger than an elder in the church? He's kind of talking to everybody. He says, you need to submit to your elders. But then he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so we're going to talk about this for a minute, but before we do, We've got to lay a foundation by looking at two verses in the book of Hebrews. Because I don't want you to think that I'm being self-serving this morning because I happen to be a pastor and you guys happen to be a congregation. And so I want to make sure that you see that what we're talking about this morning is biblical. But look at Hebrews 13.7. Put it on the screen. The author of Hebrews says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And then we jump to verse 13. Uh, 17 of the same chapter, and he says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. So let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So the author of Hebrews points out just a couple of simple things in these two verses. The, The first is that he points out that within the local church, God has established an order, and he instructs every Christian to first of all be committed to a local church and then also to arrange themselves under the authority of church leaders. In the same way that he's earlier talked about submission, Peter is saying the same thing. He says, listen, God's, God's got a plan for taking care of his people, and in the church, he's called pastors and elders to lead, and he asks that congregation would respect, honor, submit to, and follow them. But the second thing is, the author of Hebrews says, I want you to understand, this is not like some power trip. He says, these pastors and elders are going to stand before Jesus one day and be judged for how they cared for the church. And so you don't want a pastor or a leader who gives in to every bit of pressure that comes from the congregation. Pastor Randy, you teach too long. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short. Pastor Randy, you don't teach long enough. Okay, I'll make longer messages. Pastor Randy, we want this kind of music. Okay, Pastor Randy, we want this kind of music. Okay, Pastor Randy, the music's too loud. Uh, Pastor Randy, the music's too quiet. At some point, I have to pray and seek the Lord and go, oh, that's what you want. You, you, you get it? You get it? And so this is kind of what what the author of Hebrews is saying is that the way that you support your church leadership is, is to submit to their leadership. He says it's for your good. If, if you don't, he says they can't do their job. They can't care for you. So here in 1 Peter where, where Peter's talking to people about submission, I want you to understand that At the time Peter was writing, at the time the author of Hebrews was writing, there weren't hundreds of churches in every town. There was one church in every town, and it met in various locations, people's homes. And it was overseen by pastors and elders. And if you got offended at one of your church leaders, and you decided to leave the church, can I ask you a question? Where are you going to go? There was no other church in town. And so people go, well, we'll go start our own. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I think there's a problem in the American church, and that is that we think that, you know what, I don't like something that my pastor said. I don't like that he spoke about this, or I don't like that he condemned this sin or this and that. You know what? I'm out of here. Boom. And you go across town, and then you're at this other church talking bad about our church, and then That pastor says something and you don't like it, so you bounce across town and now you got two churches to talk about and you get there and after about three years, you end up back here. You're like, hey, PR, good to see you. It's like, didn't you leave here kind of in an uns... Didn't we have a meeting because you didn't like something I said, but you decided that you were, boom, and you're out of here and now you're back. It's just like, hi, I'm back. 
And in the world that Peter and the author of Hebrews is writing to, such things didn't happen because if you got into a scrap with your pastor or with a church elder and you couldn't resolve that, you found yourself out of fellowship. There was no other place to go. And so oftentimes we look at this and we're like, well, you know what? I think submission is just very, if I want to or not. Or following leadership is kind of, if I want to or not. And the author of Hebrews says, you need to rethink that. Because God doesn't see it that way. I just want to read something that came to me this week. Someone at our church has a son-in-law who's a pastor having a really tough time with a man in his church. Guy's just really opposing him, giving him a hard time. And so he, he found something on the internet. He's probably trying to self-soothe a little bit, you know, trying to figure out how do I navigate this? He comes across this article and it got sent to me. This is so, so good. Um, the pastor, he mentors 14 other pastors. The, oh, I, I miss something. This article that this guy read is written by a high-profile American church leader who mentors currently 14 other pastors. He meets with them each once a month. And he wrote in this article, he says, I have a growing concern for the American church. He says, I keep hearing story after story of the ugly and disrespectful responses that these pastors receive from the people that they are endeavoring to love. He says, most come digitally in the form of text, emails, or social media messages. And what he's implying is this allows people to say stuff to their pastor that they would never say face to face, but they'll pop off a, a text or an email or something like this. And one pastor told him, he said, Monday is the hardest day of the week for me. He says, it's not just because Sunday is so emotionally and spiritually draining, but because the barrage of messages that I get after Sunday some of which were written during the sermon from the pew. You know how you look at a timestamp? It's like, I wasn't even done offending him when he was texting me. You know, dear pastor, you know, boink. And, and what happens at that point, you got to believe, is that now the person just sits back, crosses their arms, closes their Bible, and I'm not going to receive nothing from you for the rest of the day. I'm not listening to you. And it's interesting because this author, he goes and he summarized after interviewing the 14 pastors that he is mentoring, he summarized the sheep to shepherd messages with four words. He says, the sheep are sending their, passage, their pastors disrespectful, angry, self-righteous, and vengeful communications. And, and Peter says, listen, when a person is clothed with humility, when they are putting on Christ, they will exhibit their humility by submitting to church leaders but when a person is clothed in pride, they're going to exhibit their pride by constantly being at odds with and unsubmissive to church leaders. That's what Peter's telling us here. But listen, it's not just about pew to pulpit. Peter goes on and he says, we got to talk about conflict among church people. So read also, he says, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So Peter now talks to all the people in the pews and churches, and he says, listen, if you want to have deep and you want to have meaningful, abiding fellowship with other Christians, he says, you have got to learn what Peter will call mutual submission. It's still the Greek word hupotasso, but it just simply means to arrange yourself under. Again, Philippians 2.3, put it back up on the screen. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So Peter says, not just towards your, your leaders in the church, but, but towards others in the church. He says, you have to have this attitude that everybody is more important than me. You've got to have this attitude that I'm here to serve. I have lowliness of mind. I esteem others better than myself. Can I give you guys an example? Guys, you're going to love me right now. Seriously, you guys are going to just, probably someone's going to send me money after this one. I'm going to help you guys out so much, guys. This is how you show mutual submission. Are you ready, guys? It's Sunday afternoon. Your wife says she wants to hang out. And so you say to her, oh, you want to watch NASCAR? And she goes, no. 
Oh, you want to go golfing? No. Oh, baby, you want to go to the gun range? We'll try out a couple of my new guns. No. I want to watch Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> All 10 hours. And guys, you know what you're going to do to show love? You're going to watch 10 hours of chick flicks with your wife. You want to know why? Because she's more important than you. I know none of you like me at all right now, do you guys? But ladies, you're happy with me, right? Okay, this is, this is what Peter's saying. He says, you want to talk about mutual submission. He says, you're going to do what's best for the other person. You're going to do what's best for everybody involved, not what's best for you. Paul exemplifies this. If you would, look up at the screen, 1 Corinthians 9. In the context of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul's basically, if you go through and summed it up, Paul says, listen, I have every right to do a lot of things. But he says, I've chosen to lay down my rights because it's good for you. Notice what he says. Though I'm free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. And I love that Paul throws in these parentheses, but that doesn't mean I'm a lawless man. Notice what he says. He says, not being without law towards God, (coughs) excuse me, but under law towards Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. And then he says this, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. The context is different, but the heart is exactly what we're studying in Peter. Peter and Paul are saying the same things. They're saying, listen, if you want to live as a servant, you're going to do what's best for everybody. Look up at the screen. This is a quote from Adam Clark, and just so nobody gets upset, I don't agree with everything Adam Clark teaches, but this is really good. He sums this up really well. He says, strive all to serve each other. Let the pastors strive to serve the people and the people the pastors. And let there be no contention. But who shall do most to oblige and profit all the rest? He just comes right out and he says, you want to have a peaceful church? You want want to have a peaceful church when trouble is on the outside and you're experiencing tension on the inside? He says, submit. Submit. Submit yourself to the Lord, to the leadership. Submit yourself to one another. Be a servant of all men. You're going to find that your church becomes the best place on earth to be. And he closes, and although verses 6 and 7, you know, we still have two verses to cover, we're going to really just buzz through these two. We're going to look at a couple of principles, and we're going to draw this to a close. But I want you to remember the context of the study. There was trouble outside the church creating tension inside the church. Listen, since 2020, has anybody experienced that? Say yes. Churches are under so much tension because of trouble outside the church. And Peter says, I want to talk to stressed out saints. He says here, verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He starts with the word therefore, and remember, anytime you find a therefore, you've got to figure out what it's there for, and it's so that we'll look back. And Peter is basically summarizing the last five verses. He's saying, in light of the fact that God has raised up elders to lead the church, and he's called people to be part of the church, he says, in light of the fact that we learned that sin is the source of all problem and humility is the solution. He says, in light of all that, notice what he says. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Two things here. I want you to notice that Peter says, humble yourselves. He says, you need to make a conscious choice to humble yourself. But what's interesting, I notice this. I hear this in prayer meetings all the time. Father, I just pray that you would humble us. And I used to pray that way because it just sounds spiritual, but I just want to tell you something. Do you really want God to humble you? Just, just think about that. Do you want God to humble you? You know how it would go for me? This is how it would go. I would be praying, God, just praying you would humble me, okay? And I would step up here on a Sunday morning, having prepared, and I would go blank. And I would look at you, and I would go, you know, because I got nothing. 
And it would be like, well, listen, today's going to be the absolute shortest message. Don't kill bugs. And then I would walk off. You know, I would be absolutely humiliated. And I would go in the back and I would pray. I would say, God, what was that? And he'd go, you asked. Don't ask God to humble you. I don't think any of us want to be humbled by God. It's just not going to go well. Look at those two words. Humble yourselves. He he says, after everything we've studied, the effects of pride, the definition of humility says you need to choose humility. But he says here, under the mighty hand of God, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That is an Old Testament term that describes God delivering his people during times of trouble. And Peter's talking to a church going through a time of trouble, and he says, listen, do you, you, you want to go through this victoriously? Yes. Stop walking in pride and start choosing humility. And I want to tell you why Peter wrote this, at least in my opinion. If you see something different, I would love to hear your thoughts. But how many of you find that it's kind of easy to trust God? I find it's easy to trust God. He's trustworthy. How many of you find it's less easy to trust people? Why? Well, because people let you down, right? And so Peter just said, hey, church, I need you to do two things. I need you to trust and submit to the church leadership, and then I need you to trust and submit to one another. And we're all going, him, her, them? And Peter says, wait a minute. I want you to understand something. Earthly submission is an act of faith. It requires that you trust the God who's in charge of all things. So if you put your trust and you say, hey, Pastor Randy, I'm going to submit to the leadership of this church. Ultimately, you're putting your faith in God, not us. You're saying, I'm going to submit to my church. Okay, you're, you're putting your faith in God. And that pleases God. And God says, I'm going to reward that. Notice what he says. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. See, that's why we walk in pride, because we want to have a great place. And God says, listen, I promise you a great place in my kingdom, but the way up is down. You first humble yourself, God says, then I will exalt you to some place, whether it's here on earth or whether it's when we get into the kingdom. But God says, I will bless you and exalt you in due time, but you need to understand that the way up is down. Now, let's close with verse 7. And he says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I'll say something real quick leading into this. This is not one of those standalone verses that you're supposed to quote all by itself. You see people doing stupid things. They're going to get on like a crotch rocket with no helmet, no protective gear, and they're going to go 140 miles down a freeway, and they're going to say, I'm okay because I'm casting all my cares upon him because he cares for me. God's going to keep me from crashing and dying, okay? That's not how this works. This is not one of those magic verses that you just pull out of Scripture and claim, and this is my, this is my faith promise for the day, okay? This is not what this is. This is the end of a section. Peter says, casting all your care upon him, that word care is made up of two Greek words. It's one word that means our mind, and one word that means to tear or to divide, and Peter says to this church, you guys have a divided mind. You've got a torn mind because you, you, you love God and you wake up in the morning and you read scripture and you go, God can handle anything. And then you turn on CNN and you go, the world is coming to an end, right? Do you, you guys know what I'm talking about? This is, this is the time we live in, man. We come to church, we get excited. We're like, God can do anything. And then halfway home from church because we're listening to talk radio, we are convinced, you know, that the government has hired aliens and they're coming to get us. They're going to suck our brains out and kill us all, right? Because you know how crazy things are. Peter says, listen, Christians, you've got to get your eyes off of two things because it's creating a divided mind. You need to set your eyes on one thing, and that is the fact that God cares for you. So instead of stressing out, you need to just simply trust the Lord. And Peter says, you will begin to experience peace. One of the things that's going on in a lot of churches is that pastors are stirring their flocks. And during times of trouble, pastors are supposed to calm their flocks through the teaching of the word, not through regurgitating talk radio 
and getting everybody all stirred up. The world's coming to an end, right? And Peter says, listen, cast your care upon him because he cares for you. That is the solution for stress in God's people. So most of what I did today, I taught through the text without even giving any application. I don't think I asked many questions today. So let's end with me asking a couple of questions. This is our conclusion. This is our applying what we learned today. I want to ask you as a church, as an individual, are you clothed in humility or are you walking in pride? And you may say, Pastor Andy, I don't know how to gauge that. Normally the best thing to do is to ask those people that are closest to you. Guys, go ask your wife. Wives, ask your husbands. But here's a couple of quick ways to gauge that. Am I clothed in humility or am I walking in pride? Well, hey, am I in submission to God, in submission to church leaders, and am I in mutual submission and creating peace among other believers? I think that's the acid test. That's just simply what the Lord would have us ask. Do I submit to God? Do I submit to church leaders? And do I operate in a, in, a, in a heartfelt attitude of service towards the rest of the church and that I'm in submission to other people. And the other question would ask is, am I overwhelmed with all the trouble of this world or am I walking in peace because of my relationship with God? Peter comes right out and he says, listen, if you've got a divided mind, you got to get your mind back on the truth that God is in control, that he cares for you. And I think he would tell you to address the source of the division in your mind. How, how come I come to church and I get so filled with peace and then it's not even Monday morning and I'm totally stressed out again? You've got to figure out what else you're feeding yourself with. Maybe you're drinking from the wrong well. So, Father, we are your redeemed people. We're the church. We're the people that have recognized our sin. We've asked Jesus to forgive us. We've received forgiveness by placing our trust in his finished work. We are the recipients of reconciliation because of what Jesus did. And I, I believe that Peter is challenging us and he's saying, are we taking that reconciled relationship and, and are we infusing it back into the world and back into the church by trusting God, by submitting to church leaders, by submitting to and serving one another, and by promoting peace within the body of Christ. And Lord, if there's any in this room today and we're guilty of not doing those things, thank you so much that your word says that if we confess our sin, that you are faithful, you are just, you will forgive us and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, this morning, to those who are acting like the young men that Peter wrote to, they're allowing pride to result in lack of submission, Father, would you just challenge them to clothe themselves with humility? Lord, for members of the body of Christ who are unwilling to yield their rights for the betterment of other people, Lord, would, would you show them they're walking in pride and teach them to clothe themselves with humility that the church would be a place of peace, the church would be a place of unity and harmony. And Lord, for whatever other things you've spoken to us today, we want to thank you for your Holy Spirit who speaks to us. And now what he asks is that we would respond and we would act on the things that you've challenged us with today. And that Lord, in doing so, we would experience such an amazing peace that even CNN and other news sources can't take from us because we know the God of the universe we know the God who is bigger than every problem out there. And we thank you, God, that that peace belongs to us, especially when we are walking in the things you've taught us today. Lord, these are, these are big things. These are not easy things. We need your Holy Spirit to teach us and to help us, God. We love you so much, Lord. There is a world out there creating pressure that's resulting in turmoil in the church, but I pray, Lord, that we would look at our lives and we would say, I refuse to be party to that. Rather, I am going to be 
one who promotes peace in the body of Christ that we could reach this world with the gospel instead of focusing all our energy on trying to reconcile broken relationships and things like that. And so, Lord, this is a powerful portion of Scripture. I believe that Peter wrote this with a passionate heart. And I pray, Lord, that now we could take this, we could apply it to our lives, and we could see amazing fruit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.